Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on COVID-19 update. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Nicola Sturgeon. First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, as usual, I will report on the current course of the pandemic. I will also set out the latest data and outline some further changes that we intend to make in the period ahead. Uh, these will include an update to the guidance on working from home and also a change to requirements for overseas travel. Uh, and finally, I will summarise what we can all continue to do in the immediate future to keep cases on a downward trend and reduce pressure on the National Health Service and also the economy. Uh, first, though, today's statistics, 8,022 positive cases were reported yesterday either through PCR or lateral flow tests. Uh, 1,392 people are in hospital with COVID, 43 fewer than yesterday. 49 people are in intensive care, four fewer than yesterday. Uh, this figure includes 15 patients who have been in ICU for more than 28 days. Uh, sadly, a further 23 deaths have been reported, taking the total number of deaths under the daily definition to 10,222. And once again, my condolences go to everyone mourning a loved one. Although cases do remain high, as indeed in many countries around the world, the data from this past week paints another broadly positive picture. In the seven days prior to last Tuesday's statement, almost 70,000 positive cases were identified through PCR and lateral flow testing, just under 10,000 a day. In the most recent seven days, however, there have been just over 50,000 cases, slightly more than 7,000 a day. So reported cases have fallen by just over a quarter. There have been significant reductions in every age group except the under 15s. In this younger age group, cases have increased by 41%. Uh, this will, at least to some extent, reflect the impact of the return to school. We will continue to monitor cases in this age group closely. We will also study the data carefully in coming days to see if the increase in cases amongst younger people is followed by any uptick in older age groups. The weekly survey data from the Office of National Statistics, though less up-to-date than our case numbers, nevertheless indicates a similar trend. According to the ONS, in the week to the 15th of January, the percentage of people in Scotland infected with the virus declined. As we would have expected, the decline in new cases is now reflected in a fall in the number of people being admitted to hospital with COVID. In the week to 14th January, 1,026 patients with COVID were admitted. In the following week, this fell to 704. Hospital occupancy has also fallen. Last week, a total of uh, this time last week, a total of uh, 1,546 people were in hospital with COVID. Today, it is 1,392. And the number of people with COVID in intensive care has also reduced from 59 this time last week to 49 today. Uh, this significantly improved situation gave us the confidence yesterday to lift most of the remaining protective measures that were introduced before Christmas in response to Omicron. I will have a little more to say about COVID statistics before I finish, but following the lifting of restrictions on outdoor events last week, yesterday marked a significant return to normality with the lifting of all of the following measures. Limits on attendance at indoor public events, nightclub closures, the requirement for one metre physical distancing between groups in hospitality and indoor leisure premises, the requirement for table service in hospitality venues serving alcohol on the premises and the guidance against adult indoor non-professional contact sport. On Thursday last week, we also confirmed changes to the recommendations on self-isolation for people in care homes and lifted the recommended limit on the number of households able to visit care home residents. Visits from loved ones are, of course, hugely important for the well-being of care home residents and I want to be clear that we expect care homes and local health protection teams to support visits other than in genuinely exceptional circumstances. Signing officer, the welcome progress of the past week or so has been made possible by a combination of booster vaccination, the proportionate measures introduced in December and of course the willingness of the public to adapt behaviour to stem transmission. All of that made a difference and has helped, I'm glad to say, send Omicron into reverse. Uh, this progress is real and I'm very hopeful that it can be sustained. Uh, that said, we know there are still uncertainties ahead and this virus, of course, continues to be unpredictable. 
All of this means that while our return to more normality can be made with confidence, we should still exercise some caution, and I will return to that point in a moment. Uh, but firstly, I can confirm that on the strength of the latest data, Cabinet concluded this morning that some further easing of measures is possible. Uh, firstly, as indicated last week, the current guidance on working from home, strengthened in response to Omicron, will now be updated. Instead of recommending home working whenever practical, the new guidance will pave the way for a phased return to the office. It will recommend that from Monday, 31st January, employers should consider implementing hybrid working following appropriate guidance with workers spending some time in the office and some time at home. Now, we would not expect to see a wholesale return to the office next week. Indeed, given that the level of infection, though falling, remains high, a mass return at this stage is likely to be counterproductive and indeed to set progress back. But we know there are many benefits to both employees and employers and to the economy as a whole in at least a partial return to the office at this stage. Indeed, many businesses successfully implemented hybrid working last autumn. And so as part of a phased return to the office, we will again encourage employers to consider hybrid working and look to them to determine how best to manage this transition in consultation with workers and trade unions. I can confirm two further changes. Uh, in December, in response to Omicron, a requirement for two-metre physical distancing was introduced for indoor settings where people have a specific exemption from the need to wear a face covering. Such exemptions apply, for example, to people leading religious services or carrying out some receptionist duties. From Friday, in light of the improving situation, this requirement will revert again to one metre. And second, there will be a change to the guidance on organised activities for children. This currently states that adults attending such activities should wear face coverings when indoors unless they are leading the activity. However, from Friday, face coverings will no longer be required for any adult taking part in organised activities when they are directly interacting with children under the age of five. Uh, this change will bring the guidance for indoor activities into line with that for early learning and childcare settings, and it will be of benefit, of course, to younger children and to those working with them. We are not, at this stage, recommending any immediate change to the reducing risks in schools guidance. However, this is being kept under close and regular review for schools and for the early learning and childcare sector. Uh, the advisory subgroup on education and children's issues is meeting again today. We will consider carefully any recommendations it makes and we will continue to seek its advice on issues such as groupings within schools and the requirement for secondary school pupils to wear face coverings. On the issue of face coverings, I know young people, uh, like many adults, want to see the back of them as soon as possible. But I also know that many young people understand and agree especially when cases in the younger age group are rising, that face coverings do provide important protection. So this is a matter that requires and will receive very careful ongoing consideration. Uh, finally, further changes to international travel requirements were agreed yesterday by all four UK governments. As a result, from Friday 11th February, fully vaccinated travellers will no longer need to take a test after they arrive in Scotland though they will still be required to complete a passenger locator form. Travellers to Scotland who are not fully vaccinated will still be required to take a pre-departure test no more than two days before they board their plane and also take a PCR test on or before day two of their arrival here. Now, for international travel purposes, people are deemed to be fully vaccinated if they have completed at least a primary course of vaccination. For most people, that means at least two doses. This international definition, which doesn't currently require boosters or third vaccines, uh, will be kept under review. The four UK governments also agreed to work on a new surveillance system to identify any future variants of concern. The Scottish Government would have preferred this system to be in place before removing the need for vaccinated people to take tests. However, as we have done in the past, we do recognise the wider benefits of adopting a common approach where that is possible. While these changes will be very welcome to travellers and, of course, to the travel industry, it is important and, I think, responsible to point out that no government can completely rule out having to tighten travel requirements again if certain circumstances, most obviously another new variant, were to arise. But for now, and hopefully for the long term, it is really positive that these measures can be lifted. It opens the way for family reunions, the prospect again of holidays overseas and, of course, much needed support for the travel sector. 
Presiding officer, I am hugely grateful to everyone who has complied with the type of protective measures that have been in force over the past month or so. Our collective efforts have made a huge difference. I know that many people now, and rightly so, will be looking forward to getting back to concerts, shows, sporting occasions and other events. Many others will be looking forward to meeting up with larger groups of friends or having a pint at a bar without the need for table service. Whatever it is you are looking forward to doing again, uh, do enjoy it and also know that in the process of enjoying it, you will be supporting businesses and organisations that have been through the mill. However, to make sure we sustain our progress, please continue to exercise appropriate care and caution. The level of infection, though declining overall, is still high, with around 7,000 cases a day being confirmed just now. Indeed, the decline may be starting to plateau. And also, as I reported earlier, cases in the under 15s are actually rising. Also, hundreds of people with COVID are still being admitted to hospital each week, which means the NHS is still under immense pressure. We can say without fear of contradiction, I think, that this is the toughest winter the NHS has ever faced. And we know that, however welcome, any lifting of protective measures that have helped stem transmission can lead to an uptick in cases in the weeks that follow. So all of this demands a degree of continued caution, even as we do enjoy a return to pre-Omicron normality. So for the rest of the month, at least even though there are no longer any recommended upper limits, do try to keep indoor social gatherings as small as circumstances allow, and please continue to comply with all of the baseline protective measures that remain in force. Continuing, for example, to wear face coverings indoors and on public transport can help all of us to say, stay safe while we travel and meet up more. So will taking lateral flow tests before meeting up with others. Please continue to do this. All of these basic measures help us protect each other while getting on with daily life. And of course, they are especially important for the protection of those at highest clinical risk from COVID. Indeed, this week marks the introduction of a further initiative designed to help people who need extra support to get out and about with more confidence. The Distance Aware Scheme is intended to help people who might be worried about going out. Badges and lanyards with the Distance Aware logo will be available to anyone who wants one and will indicate to other people that the person wearing the logo would like a bit of extra space and a bit more care taken around them. The badges and lanyards are available free at mobile and community libraries across the country this week and badges are also available in most ASDA supermarkets. They're also available online from some participating charities. So if you or anyone you know is nervous or worried about being out and about again, and if you would feel safer with a bit more space around you, please do get a distance aware badge or lanyard. And for everyone else, if you see someone wearing this badge or lanyard, do give them the space and consideration that they are asking for. This is, I think, another small but really important way of helping each other through this situation that does remain difficult, challenging and stressful for many. Signing officer, finally, let me stress again that vaccination continues to be the cornerstone of our battle against COVID. The very high vaccination rates achieved so far have helped us considerably on our path back to normality. From this week, five to 11-year-olds with specific medical conditions are being invited for vaccine appointments. Parents and carers will either receive a letter inviting them to call the national phone line or a letter direct from their local health board. The types of medical conditions that make children eligible for the vaccine are set out at NHS Inform, and a leaflet will be made available in advance of appointments with answers to questions that parents and carers might have. There's also, as I indicated last week, a self-help guide on the NHS Inform website, which young people, parents and carers can use to check eligibility for the vaccine. In addition, reminder letters have been sent to 12 to 17 year olds who are yet to complete their primary course of two doses. And we are preparing to send scheduled appointments for February to any remaining 18 to 59 year olds who are yet to be boosted. 16 and 17 year olds can also book boosters as soon as they approach 12 weeks from their second dose. I would take this opportunity again to urge anyone who is eligible for a primary dose or a booster who hasn't yet had it to please get it as soon as possible. Hospital data continues to show, even when it's adjusted for age, that someone not fully vaccinated is considerably more likely to require hospital treatment than someone who has had a booster or third dose. 
Being fully vaccinated is the single most important thing any of us can do to protect ourselves, to protect others, and of course to protect the National Health Service. Signing officer, we are also, as I set out last week, continuing to consider the adaptations that might be necessary in future to help us manage the virus more sustainably and less restrictively. We will consult on and publish the updated strategic framework in the coming weeks. In doing so, we will take careful account of the developing international evidence as well as the data here. I was struck by remarks made by the head of the World Health Organization yesterday. He said, and I quote, learning to live with COVID cannot mean that we give this virus a free ride. He also warned, and again I'm quoting, that globally the conditions are ideal for more variants to emerge. It is clear, therefore, that we must continue to learn from experience and we must be prepared to adapt to a range of different circumstances. And on that point, I want to address directly a claim made in recent weeks by uh, some opposition members to the effect that the protective measures here uh, introduced in response to Omicron were unnecessary and that data shows that Scotland's more cautious approach achieved no more than England's less protective approach. In response, I told Parliament last week that, uh, and again I quote, the ONS figures this week show that infection levels in England are over 20% higher than those in Scotland. Uh, Willie Rennie issued a few days press release on the back of this saying that I had twisted the data. He also reported me to the impartial chair of the UK Statistics Authority. I'm pleased to say that he has now written back to Mr Rennie. Oddly, as far as I'm aware, Mr Rennie has not press released uh, the reply. Uh, so David Norgrove, the chair of the UK Statistics Authority, says in his reply that I, again quoting, correctly stated that the figure for England was more than 20% higher than the figure for Scotland. Uh, but he goes further than that. While acknowledging that there are other equally accurate ways to cite the statistics, he concludes as follows. The data does suggest that the rate of infection is lower in Scotland than in England. Signing officer, to me what matters is that Scotland is doing better now than we were doing before Christmas and better now than we might have been doing had we not taken action to stem transmission. That is what is important. How we are faring relative to England or anywhere else is not, in my view, the key comparison. But given that others have sought to draw that comparison inaccurately in an attempt to undermine confidence in the Scottish Government's decisions, I hope all members will now accept the conclusion of the Chair of the UK Statistics Authority that the data I cited was indeed accurate. <laughs> members, at this stage, as protective measures ease and we head into spring, there are very good grounds to be optimistic that we are again on the cusp of a calmer phase of the pandemic. We can all help ensure that the waters remain calm by taking the sensible steps we know help stem transmission. First, please do get fully vaccinated as soon as you can. Second, continue to take care when socialising. We are no longer suggesting a limit for the number of households who meet indoors, but for the rest of this month, try to limit as far as you can the size of indoor gatherings that you do have. And please take a lateral flow test before you go every time. Finally, please take the other precautions that we know make a difference. Keep windows open when meeting indoors. Continue to work from home from now, but talk to your employer about a return to hybrid working from the start of next month. We have face covering on public transport, in shops and when moving about in hospitality. And please follow all advice on hygiene. These measures are making a difference, so please do stick with them to protect yourself, to protect others and to protect the National Health Service. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 40 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now or enter R in the chat function. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I apologise for missing the very beginning of the statement today? The latest data on COVID is very positive. And going forward, it is vital that we trust people across Scotland to judge what is best for them and their families. Yet the First Minister's statement says that from the end of January, guidance on working from home will still advise against a wholesale return to the office. While some people will still want to work from home, why does not the First Minister leave that decision up to employers and the workers themselves? And what, and what does she think this means for the businesses? 
who rely on workers being back in the office and back in our communities, our city centres and our town centres. Those businesses also have another issue to deal with, caused solely by this SNP government. Six weeks on from the announcement of more COVID funds, and weeks after restrictions were introduced that have now been removed, businesses are still waiting. Sure. A document I've seen from SNP-run Murray Council says this about the government's record, and it's a quote. Throughout the pandemic, there has been a considerable gap between announcements and providing details, guidance and grant offer letters to local authorities. And yesterday, businesses told the First Minister directly, stop ramping up plans to split up our country and fully focus on Scotland's economic recovery. Isn't it about time that the First Minister listened and got on with delivering for Scotland instead of dividing Scotland? So, First Minister, just when will these businesses who are crying out for support get the cash they need? Finally, throughout this pandemic, there has been agreement that children's education must come first. But right now, adults can sit in workplaces and pubs without face masks, but pupils in the classroom are still required to wear them. The First Minister isn't even following public health advice on this. University of Edinburgh expert Christine Tate Burkhard said this week, and I quote, I would expect for schools that removal of face masks to be relatively soon, as in early to mid-February. And the National Clinical Director Jason Leach said this week, I think the day is coming when masks in schools will be removed. So can I ask the First Minister, what are you waiting for? Why has the government not set a date for the removal of face masks in our classrooms? First Minister. The first presenting officer, the latest data is very encouraging, but I think anybody with a modicum of common sense looking at that data would also say that it calls for continued good sense and uh, caution. Uh, it is that approach, that balanced approach, that has brought us to where we are today in a much stronger position and able to look forward with much more optimism. Uh, I know uh, from long experience in politics uh, that opinion polls are not everything, but they do sometimes uh, give us uh, a useful insight into the state of public opinion. And a poll just at the end of last week showed that uh, I think two thirds uh, of people in Scotland or thereabouts actually support uh, the proportionate balanced approach that the Scottish Government took before Christmas in response to Omicron. I would suggest it's Douglas Ross that is out of touch uh, with public opinion here uh, rather than the Scottish Government. Let me, let me take the points in turn on working from home um, and why we don't just leave it to the good sense of employers and workers. Um, I know Douglas Ross, through no fault of his, we started a bit early, was late, but I think he was in the chamber before um, I got to this point in my statement. But just in case he wasn't, let me read it again, or in case he wasn't listening. So as part of a phased return to the office, we will again encourage employers to consider hybrid working and look to them to determine how best to manage this transition in consultation with workers and trade unions. Uh, anybody looking at the data, anyone looking at the data right now uh, would say that a mass return to the office from next week, uh, with all that goes with that in terms of travel to work, people coming together, would risk setting back this progress. It would not be responsible, and that's why the Scottish Government is not going to encourage it. In terms of financial support, uh, payments have already been made to affected businesses in every council area. All 32 local authorities are making payments to eligible hospitality and leisure uh, businesses, and uh, payments are also being made by Creative Scotland, uh, by Visit Scotland. And let me remind Douglas Ross again that this is funding available in Scotland uh, that has not been available in the rest of the UK. Something, something that was criticised by the Nighttime Industries Association in England uh, and indeed uh, others in England. And finally, presiding officer, on the issue of face coverings in schools, possibly one of the issues where we need to take greatest care. Nobody wants young people or anybody to wear face coverings for as long as possible. I hope the time is coming where that won't be necessary. But anyone, anyone with a degree of responsibility who in face of what I have reported today, a 41% increase in cases in the under 15 age group who says that this is the moment to say that young people no longer need to wear face coverings. 
frankly, isn't showing responsibility. And Douglas Ross says, when shouting from a sedentary position, almost uh, in a childlike fashion, forgets that we are in the face of an unpredictable virus and it is important to take these decisions, not pluck dates out of mid-air, but to take these decisions responsibly. That's why the approach of this government has such overwhelming support from the Scottish people. Anna Sarwa. President, officer, can I start by sending my condolences to all those that have lost a loved one? This update confirms what we have been hoping, that the picture is improving. COVID has changed our society and our world. People accepted unprecedented restrictions and made extraordinary sacrifices. And when the pandemic first hit, governments were given the emergency powers needed to deliver a swift response to the crisis. But things have moved on since then. Two years on, it is clear that COVID is not going away but there is hope. Research and innovation have given us tools like testing to identify and help contain outbreaks. Vaccines have helped reduce the severity of infections. And we have new treatments and antivirals for those who become ill. So people and businesses cannot be expected to live their lives subject to ad hoc and last minute decision making from government. Going forward, we need a new approach. Yesterday, Scottish Labour set out a strategy for living well with COVID. It seeks to learn the lessons of the last two years and looks at how we build resilience into public services, protect the most vulnerable and provide as much certainty as possible. In this new phase, any new decisions must be proportionate and clearly communicated. So will the First Minister commit to engaging seriously with these proposals? That means clear triggers, what restrictions would follow and a framework of the financial support businesses and workers would expect. It also means rolling capacity for vaccines, testing and tracing pandemic-proofing our schools, and, crucially, proper data sharing and parliamentary scrutiny. And finally, does the First Minister accept that the situation we now face is very different to that of March 2020, and therefore we cannot expect people to live their lives in perpetual crisis? First Minister. Uh, firstly, the situation is very different to March 2020, and people are not living their lives as they were asked to do in March 2020. And I think anybody who suggests that we haven't changed our response uh, and adapted to changing circumstances is not paying attention or not wanting to recognise uh, those changes. Uh, we will look seriously at the proposals Anna Sarwar puts forward, as we will look seriously at proposals anyone puts forward. I've said before uh, we will consult widely as we develop the updated strategic framework over uh, the coming weeks. It's important that we get that right. I think it's important that we go beyond sound bites, pandemic proofing schools. Yeah, we all want to do that, but that comes down to serious investments, such as the investments we are making in better ventilation and in other mitigation uh, measures. I think we have to take care about uh, having a rigidity of approach around triggers because what we have learned uh, over particularly the last few months is that different variants don't behave in the same way as previous variants. So if you have too rigid an approach, then you don't adapt properly to the reality of the situation you're facing. That is why there continues to be a need for judgment um, and good sense in how we try to balance things. But we will consider any proposals that are put forward. Um, it's not the case that responses are ad hoc uh, or last minute. We respond to changing circumstances. We would be failing in our obligation if we didn't do that. And I do believe the action we took before Christmas it has been shown to have been worthwhile because of the much better position we are in now. Uh, and so, yes, we need to have a, a great, uh, as great as possible a clarity uh, in our future approach, but uh, we would be acting at our peril if we did not retain the ability to be flexible. And I go back to the comments from the head of the WHO. Living with this does not simply mean giving this virus a free ride. We've got to be smart in how we deal with it, and that's what we will continue to seek to do. And, yes, we will consult as we do so. Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, presiding, officer. Uh, presiding officer, in November, John Swinney told me in the chamber that, and I quote, anybody who comes to parliament and seeks to diminish COVID's enormous impact on our national health service is not recognising the reality of the situation that we face. In December, we learned about the worst poverty-related attainment gap on record, and the Education so uh, Secretary told the chamber, we are in a global pandemic, and that context is exceptionally important. Finally, earlier this month, I warned about children waiting years for mental health treatment, and the Minister said we're in the midst of a pandemic, the most precarious time. There are a litany 
of social problems that this country faces that ministers have sought to excuse and defer with reference to the pandemic. Yet, miraculously, we're told this weekend that by the, the threat of the virus has abated such that in 2023 we can hold another referendum on independence. Those problems and those people have not gone away. Those patients waiting in pain for operations, children who've missed out on life qualifying education, frontline staff on their knees in want of a break. Does she understand the anger and the frustration that, at, that at her government as it turns its eyes away from them and back to the tired old divisions of the past. First Minister. I think Alec Cole Hamilton is the only one in this chamber today that's turning his eyes away from these issues. Uh, we focus on these issues each and every single day and that will continue as we come out of this pandemic and hopefully into the recovery uh, phase. But yes, we will also, uh, in the interest of democracy, seek to take forward the mandate we won less than a year ago at uh, the Scottish Parliament election to allow people in Scotland to choose whether to complete the powers of this Parliament to better equip us to deal with uh, these issues that Alec Cole Hamilton uh, has set out. Because these things are, of course, very closely related. Let me just pick up on two examples. Child poverty. Uh, we're making great it strides in great efforts, chiefly through the Scottish Child Payment, to uh, tackle child poverty in Scotland. But as we do that, the powers that are still held at Westminster are being used to pull in the other direction. Completing the powers of this Parliament would significantly help in that task. And secondly, in relation to staff in the front line of our National Health Service, exhausted because of COVID and the other pressures on our National Health Service, but one of the exacerbating factors are staffing shortages and recruitment issues exacerbated by Brexit imposed upon Scotland against our will. Again, completing the powers of this Parliament through independence would ensure uh, that we were in charge of our own destiny. So actually making sure that Scotland addresses these issues and that Scotland fulfils its potential uh, will be enhanced by Scotland becoming independent. And I think everybody, including Alec Cole Hamilton, should perhaps lift their eyes and their ambition. I call Natalie Dawn to be followed by Sue Webber. Thank you, President Officer. Women's health and wellbeing has to be an absolute priority during pregnancy, and I was pleased that pregnant women were last month added to the JCVI's priority list for the vaccine and the booster. Would the First Minister be able to confirm if the rate of vaccine uptake amongst pregnant women has increased since being added as a priority group? And would she join me in encouraging pregnant women to come forward for their first, second or booster? provide them and their babies with the strongest level of protection from the virus as possible. First Minister. Uh, yes, I would strongly echo uh, Natalie Dawn's call to pregnant women to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, Public Health Scotland uh, will publish their next analysis of vaccinations in pregnancy on the 2nd of February. Uh, previously published data showed uh, that from the start of the vaccination programme until August last year, uptake of the vaccine amongst pregnant women was lower than for non-pregnant women, uh, but it was increasing. And according to the most recent data published by Public Health Scotland in September and October, uptake has been more similar in pregnant women compared to the general female population. So this increasing uptake is encouraging. Vaccination is the best way to protect against known risks of COVID in pregnancy for both women and for babies, including admission of uh, women to intensive care and premature births. So I do urge all those who are pregnant uh, who have not already done so to book their vaccination as soon as possible. And thank Natalie Dawn for raising such an important issue. Sue Webber to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, presiding officer. Figures released this morning show that 47% of registered patients have not seen an NHS dentist within the last two years, while oral health inequalities amongst children have widened to the worst level on record. As dentistry recovers from the pandemic, patients across the country are facing long waits for routine treatment. So what steps is the First Minister's Government taking to help restore such NHS dental treatments across Scotland, especially now given the withdrawal of emergency funding from the 1st of April. First Minister. Um, obviously, throughout the pandemic, there were a range of emergency provisions put in place, including uh, for people who required uh, dental care and treatment. Uh, we have uh, more recently been supporting uh, dentists to recover, to get back to normal, to ensure that they can do uh, the range of procedures that they would do ordinarily uh, before the pandemic, and that will continue, including uh, with appropriate investment. 
Um, the point about emergency funding is one, that, of course, that we make more widely. We are not completely out of this uh, pandemic yet, but much of the consequential funding uh, for uh, COVID and for COVID recovery is not continuing. That has knock-on impacts on our budget, but within that, we continue to support dentists uh, and others within the National Health Service to the very best of our ability. Pauline McNeill, to be followed by Ruth Maguire. City centres like Glasgow have been hit harder economically than most UK cities, in particular retail and hospitality. Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen City airports have lost 4,500 jobs between them as a result of the pandemic. And in Glasgow, it reports that passenger numbers are equivalent to what they were in 1973. It does the First Minister agree that connectivity is vital for our economy? I wonder if she can tell me when she plans to engage with our airport industry to ensure that Scotland is not at a competitive disadvantage and we can start to see connectivity help recover our city economies. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree that connectivity is vital for uh, the prospects of our economy. It's also important for many other uh, reasons, for, for family and, and personal reasons. Uh, but we also have to recognise, and I'm sure Polly McNeill does recognise, that international travel, particularly in the face of new variants of this virus, uh, still poses one of the, the biggest risks in terms of transmission. So this is always going to be a difficult issue. I think we're in a, a much better place now. This has been incredibly difficult for Scotland's airports, aviation sector, travel industry more widely. Of course, we continued uh, with rates relief uh, for the aviation sector, I think, longer than other parts of the UK. But Scotland is not unique in this. There are many, many countries uh, across the world who are still uh, managing travel restrictions as part of managing uh, this virus. I think we're in a better place now. The uh, changes to requirements that I've outlined today that come into force shortly will significantly help international travel return to a degree of normality. And I think we can look forward at this stage uh, to greater normality around international travel for family connections, uh, for business, for holidays, and that will help uh, the airport sector with that process of recovery. But we will continue to engage with them about how we can support the wider sector uh, to recover as quickly as possible from what I absolutely accept has been a torrid time for them. Ruth Maguire to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As restrictions and protections are eased and we begin to adapt to living with COVID-19, for some of my constituents, especially those in higher risk groups, this will be an anxious time. Can the First Minister outline how the Distance Aware Scheme might help provide confidence and support to people who are worried about mixing with others? First Minister. I think this is a really important point that it is vital not to uh, just pass over. The majority of us are really keen to get back to as much norm normality as we can as quickly as possible. We are desperate to do all of the things that we enjoy doing before COVID. But there are some people within our society, uh, particularly, of course, those at highest clinical risk, but many older people who feel very nervous about getting back to normal, who still worry about the risk that COVID presents. And we've got to try to, in that spirit of solidarity that has served as well, strike the right balance so that everybody can feel confident about the, uh, the path that lies ahead. The Distance Aware Scheme is a really important initiative in that context. It's voluntary, but it does allow us to support anyone who might be a bit more worried about mixing with others uh, or, or who perhaps just wants a bit more time to adjust to the transition. So these badges, lanyards can be uh, acquired and they will help people in that circumstance if all of us respect uh, the wishes of those wearing them. And I think this is one way of helping ensure that we make this transition back to normality in a way that is as inclusive as possible and recognises the impact on mental health, on wellbeing and on the anxiety levels of many people who are very uh, and particularly vulnerable to the virus. Julian Mackay to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have previous, previously expressed concern in this chamber about the removal of PCR testing for vaccinated people travelling into Scotland. I note the First Minister's warning that no government can rule out having to once again tighten restrictions if a new variant were to arise. But does she recognise that the removal of PCR testing could undermine our ability to detect and therefore prevent the spread of new variants? Can the First Minister provide any detail on the new surveillance system that is to be introduced? First Minister. So, yes, I, I do recognise that concern. I, to some extent, share that concern. I, our preference, as I said earlier on, would have been uh, not to remove uh, the, the testing requirement until we had a new surveillance system in place. But 
On the other hand, we do recognise both the benefits and also to some extent the practical necessity of having common uh, travel requirements in place in all four nations of the UK. So these are difficult balances that we try to strike as well as we can. Uh, PCR tests are important because of uh, the way in which they then enable genomic sequencing. Genomic sequencing is very important in terms of the detection of new variants. So work uh, will be taken forward, I hope, as quickly as possible to get uh, a proportionate and targeted new surveillance system in place. And as that work proceeds, uh, we will keep Parliament up to date. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the First Minister advise as to how much it costs to treat the average patient with COVID-19 in intensive care? And does she agree that the huge financial impact on the NHS is yet another reason why people not yet fully vaccinated and therefore more vulnerable should be vaccinated and boosted? First Minister. Um, it I'm not able today to put a precise figure um, on that, but we do know that intensive care is the most resource-heavy form of NHS inpatient care. Um, it's essential for the treatment of the sickest patients. It costs several thousand pounds uh, per day uh, because it uses more staff uh, per patient than any other type of inpatient care. And of course, our intensive care teams are amongst the very best in the world. Um, now, we don't make admission choices and should never make admission choices based on uh, considerations of resource in that way. But of course, if there is something all of us can do in the face of this virus uh, to minimise our chances of needing intensive care, then for all sorts of reasons, we should do that. And right now, vaccination is one way that we know reduces our chances of getting seriously ill if we get this virus. So uh, for that reason, as well as for the unnecessary risk you're posing to yourself and others, if you are choosing not to be vaccinated right now without good reason, uh, then you are being deeply irresponsible. And I would urge you to change your mind and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Jamie Green to be followed by Siobhan Brown. Thank you. Uh, yesterday, Dr Jane Morris, Chair, Vice Chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland, reminded us that whilst COVID restrictions serve a physical health purpose, they also have a mental health consequence. Nearly 2,000 young people in Scotland have waited more than a year for an appointment with CAMS. Uh, these were shocking statistics long before COVID. Many young people are simply desperate, and for some, sadly, it's just too late. Will the First Minister commit to putting every ounce of government focus and attention into supporting and rebuilding the nation's mental health off the back of COVID and back that up with a plan and all the resource that it both needs and deserves? First Minister. Uh, yes, we, of course, had a focus on this before the pandemic, particularly around uh, child and adolescent mental health services, redesigning the way services were offered with much more focus on community services and uh, preventative early intervention services, counsellors in schools, for example, um, and that work will continue. And uh, the member is right to say that it is even more important now than it was uh, before the pandemic struck. Um, I do recognise that uh, physical restrictions have a mental health impact. Uh, everything we've had to do in response uh, to this pandemic to stem transmission of a virus has had impacts in other ways. I think the fallacy, I'm not suggesting it is what Jamie Green is putting forward here, but I think the fallacy we all we often hear is if we just hadn't uh, introduced these restrictions, then somehow there would have been no impacts. Without restrictions, uh, transmission uh, would have got more out of hand and the mental health and wellbeing impact of that would have been considerable too. So this has always been a very difficult uh, balance to strike for governments everywhere. We continue to do it as well as we can, but we absolutely recognise the work that needs to be done to recover the impacts uh, that our response to the pandemic has had. And mental health is definitely uh, one area uh, where that is particularly important. Siobhan Brown to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Chair of the UK Statistics Authority has confirmed that the First Minister accurately described COVID infections and that the figure for England was more than 20% higher than the figure for Scotland. That success was achieved because the people across Scotland stuck with the necessary restrictions put in place to protect lives and the NHS. Does the First Minister agree with me? that Willie Rennie should now apologise to the Chamber for his ham-fisted bid to twist data to the people of Scotland for failing to acknowledge the sacrifices they have made. And lastly, but not leastly, to Sir David Norgrove, the head of the UK Statistics Authority, for wasting his time. First Minister. Look, this is important. It is really vital that people like me show integrity and accuracy when we cite statistics. Sometimes we get it wrong and make mistakes. And it is important that we recognise that. But for somebody uh, to accuse me when 
you know, a cursory glance at what I was citing last week would have shown that it was accurate to accuse me of twisting data and um, reporting to uh, the chief statistician, uh, I think, uh, was uh, uncalled for. And there's a more substantive point here. I don't believe that the comparison between Scotland and England is the one that we should be focusing on. I think the comparison we should be focusing on is the one between how Scotland is doing now compared to how we were doing at the start of the Omicron wave and how we might have been doing now had we not taken the sensible proportionate steps. But opposition members, eh, for reasons that I really can't fathom, because I don't really understand the politics of this other than pure political opportunism, have tried to suggest somehow eh, and eh, to say that the data suggests that the restrictions in Scotland made no difference. So I think it is good now eh, that we have at that confirmation that the data I cited in response to these claims last week was accurate, that the actions the government has taken, more importantly the action that the public has taken, has got Scotland into a much stronger position than we would otherwise have been. And I think if we can all just put party politics aside for a moment in the midst of a global pandemic, we might all actually find that that is something to warmly welcome. Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand the need to balance lifting restrictions with the need to protect people most at risk from the virus, and I share the First Minister's appeal for people to, to show solidarity with people who are most at risk. But I can't help but feel a bit uncomfortable with the distance aware badges. These appear to shift the burden of protection onto the people most at risk. So can I ask the government what engagement it has had with the people who are most at risk of this, and including the people who were shielding? First Minister. Uh, we engage with different groups all the time. I'll come back to the member or ask a minister to come back to the member on the, the detail of, of consultation. Look, I, I, I recognise and accept that observation. I would stress again that the distance aware scheme is voluntary. We're not asking anybody or, or expecting anybody to comply with it. But I know that many people, uh, I've had you know, sort of representations from people uh, saying that something like that would be helpful. If there is a better way of doing this, I am open to considering that. I'm not suggesting that we've come up with the, the best possible way that we could ever. What we're trying to do here is strike a balance between the majority who want to get back to normal, to go to pubs and concerts and just act as normal, and uh, the group in our society, or groups, because it is not a, a homogenous group, that feels nervous about that. I've got people in my own family that express that nervousness. Uh, people with particular health conditions will especially feel that. And it's just trying to strike a balance and find practical ways of doing that. So it's done in really good faith and for the best of reasons. But if there are better ways of doing that, then genuinely I'm happy to listen to them and to give them full consideration. Fiona Hislop to be followed by Craig Hoy. Mm -hmm. Does the First Minister agree that as part of the strategy for living with COVID here in Scotland, we will need to learn to adapt and respond to future variants which could emerge in other parts of the world, and we will always be vulnerable to potentially sudden decisions affecting the economy and society unless and until there is an effective global strategy for global vaccination? And what is the Scottish Government doing to encourage the UK to play its proper and full part in that drive? First Minister. Uh, Fiona Hislop is right to say that uh, the possibility of future variants remains uh, is the biggest risk we face right now. I should say, just as an aside, uh, the UK uh, Health Security Agency confirmed uh, just at the end of last week that it has designated a, a sub-lineage of Omicron as a variant under investigation. We think there uh, may be a small number of, of these cases here in Scotland, but we are uh, monitoring that uh, carefully. But that, uh, I say, simply to illustrate that wider point. And the global nature of this is really important as well. Uh, we will not, none of us be completely free of this pandemic until everyone is free. And that means uh, the importance of extending vaccination globally. It really can't be overstated. I, in December, wrote to the Prime Minister to urge the UK government to end its opposi opposition at the World Trade Organisation and to join over uh, 100 other countries who are now supportive of a temporary trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights waiver. Um, and I think it's important, and I would repeat that call. Um, and for Scotland, although no, not part of the COVAX scheme, we provided international development funding to support vaccine preparedness and delivery um, in our partner uh, countries. So we have a responsibility, uh, and we will exercise that responsibility, but we will also continue to call on other governments to take responsible action to get vaccination uh, right across the globe as quickly as possible. 
Craig Coy to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Dep uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, speaking in Parliament on September the 9th, the Deputy First Minister said, and I quote, we are saying that certification passports will be in place for a period up until the end of February 2022, but they would automatically expire at that moment. First Minister, is that still the case? And if not, why not? First Minister. Uh, in terms of the legislation uh, that is in place, uh, I'm sure what the Deputy First Minister set out is the case in terms of the, the expiration. If we uh, consider that there is a need to extend that, we will come to Parliament in the normal way and set that out. Um, nobody wants any of these measures to be in place for any longer than necessary, uh, but I think we uh, can safely say that it is because we have been prepared to take uh, sensible, proportionate steps, because the public has responded so magnificently, that we are managing again uh, to send COVID into reverse. Um, and so we need to continue to be responsible about this. If it ha asking people to show uh, COVID certificates it keeps nightclubs open, allows sporting events to go ahead, then that is a much more proportionate measure than restricting or closing these kinds of venues and events again. Um, I come back to a point I've made uh, regularly, and I, I think uh, the facts bear me out here. Uh, the Conservatives have literally opposed almost every sensible measure we've taken in order uh, to control this virus. And to be honest, uh, we would be in a much more difficult position if we had followed that advice. So I think the public support, the cautious proportionate approach we're taking, will take it for as long as necessary, and we will lift measures as soon as it is possible to do so. Willie Coffey to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister if she'll say something more about hybrid working opportunities as we slowly recover from the pandemic? Some of the surprising gains we experienced was in the deployment of digital technology to enable hybrid working and home working to happen and to help people achieve a better work-life balance too. Does the government support this continuing and how can we guard against dropping back to the old norm of everyone piling onto our motorways and into their offices five days a week to get to and to carry out their work? First Minister. Well, in terms of hybrid working, I mean, actually a lot of businesses implemented a hybrid approach quite successfully in the autumn uh, last year before, of course, we had to pull back again and tighten the guidance on home working in response to Omicron. So we're asking businesses uh, to consider going back to that again, to talk to workers' trade unions about how they can best do that in their own circumstances. In summary, it means people being in the office sometime, working from home at other times, a mix of staff perhaps being office-based and home-based. Uh, government can and shouldn't seek to mandate what that looks like in every working environment, uh, but it is important that we're moving from uh, you know, a, a very heavy work from home whenever possible advice uh, to something that is much uh, more about enabling a phased return to the office. But Willie Coffey is right to say that I think all businesses, I know many businesses already are doing this, are taking uh, the unfortunate and unwelcome uh, experience of the pandemic in the last two years, to think afresh about the best configuration for their workforces in the future. There will be many people who are sick of working from home and want to get back to the office. Many businesses will want that. It has knock-on uh, benefits for people in the office in city centre economies, for example. But there are also many people who think it's more productive to work from home. It improves their work-life balance. And of course, it has environmental benefits. Uh, so getting that balance right in the months and years to come, uh, again, will not be easy. But it is an opportunity to rethink things uh, and not simply go back to the status quo as it was before the pandemic. Big challenges here, but I suspect big opportunities for our economy and our society too. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, on the 23rd of December, there has been a mor moratorium on fertility treatment for women who are un unvaccinated. This has cross-party support. But I wonder, could the First Minister explain to my constituents why this moratorium is required and when will it be reviewed again? First Minister. Um, I think um, I set out the Government's position on this at quite some length last week um, when I, I made this statement, and I would uh, refer members and anybody interested to that answer. Uh, in short, and it goes back to the question I was asked earlier on about vaccination of, of pregnant women, we know the risks uh, for pregnant women, both to uh, a woman and uh, to an unborn baby, are uh, significantly increased if uh, there is no vaccination and uh, the pregnant woman gets 
COVID, uh, the judgment was made uh, that there should be a pause on fertility treatment for those unvaccinated. I set out uh, last week, though, that people should uh, discuss with their uh, clinical advisers uh, the situation, and we do keep this under careful review. I absolutely and fully understand uh, the stress and anxiety that any woman, um, any couple, uh, will go through um, as they uh, seek fertility treatment. And it's important that we enable that, facilitate that as much as possible, but we also have to understand the wider risks uh, that exist around COVID, particularly for those without vaccination. Karen Adam to be followed by Paul O'Kane. President Officer, many people are planning ahead and organising their summer holiday, which may include travelling abroad. What advice can the First Minister give to those people in light of COVID? First Minister. Well, as I said in my statement, we have agreed with the other UK nations to relax international travel requirements uh, from the 11th of February. That means fully vaccinated travellers will no longer need to take a test on arrival here. I think that will benefit Scottish residents wanting to travel abroad, whether that's to visit loved ones they've not seen in some time, or indeed to have a summer holiday that uh, they've not had the opportunity to do for a couple of years. So I do think um, it is possible uh, for people to look forward to this summer with much more confidence about booking summer holidays. We are still in a global pandemic, though, and the situation in other countries is changeable, just as the situation here uh, is still prone to change. So I think people have to recognise that when they book a holiday, the rules might say one thing, but in the country they're travelling to, for example, by the time it comes to go, the rules may be uh, different. I think it's common sense to bear that in mind, but I do think uh, there is much more optimism about the prospect for summer holiday travel uh, this year than there has been uh, in the last two years. And I'm sure many people will be looking forward uh, to getting overseas and possibly even getting some sun. Paul O'Kane to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, I was contacted by a constituent who had cancer surgery cancelled with only a few days' notice, as there were no beds in recovery or in any other ward for cancer procedures at our local hospital. Um, last year, the target for 95 per cent of urgent referrals with a suspicion of cancer to start treatment within 62 days was missed again. My constituent's family are calling out for additional capacity to treat cancer patients. Will the First Minister listen to their anxious pleas and the pleas of so many and take action on waiting lists and delayed discharge, which was too high pre-pandemic, and introduce a robust recovery plan for cancer services? First Minister. Well, cancer is a core part of the NHS recovery plan. Uh, cancer treatment and cancer surgery it will be cancelled only as an absolute last resort. Cancer has remained a priority right throughout the pandemic, and uh, we are very focused on getting uh, those cancer services or, or patients for whom cancer services uh, have been disrupted back to normal as quickly as, as possible. Um, and we are uh, taking action to improve early diagnosis, uh, taking action to improve uh, cancer services. The 62, I think, 8 out of 10 uh, are seen within the 62, uh, which is a whole journey. Uh, waiting time. Uh, the 31-day target, of course, is met, but on the 62 one, we are working, uh, of course, to improve that and, and to meet that. The core to this, though, of course, is to keep COVID cases on the downward uh, trend, because that then uh, reduces the COVID pressure on hospitals, whether that is in uh, general hospital wards or waiting times for surgery or recovery. Uh, if we get the COVID cases continuing to come down and that pressure on hospitals continuing to come down, uh, then the need to cancel other operations uh, diminishes as well. So that's why the efforts to get COVID under control are so important to that overall wider recovery for the National Health Service. Christine Graham, to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, NHS Borders, as elsewhere, has substantial staff absences directly due to COVID. So it's asked the public to ease pressure on accident and emergency, not to attend unless absolutely necessary, for example, with severe breathing difficulties or severe bleeding. Does she therefore agree with NH Borders in this and that the public should access expert advice, if it's appropriate, from alternatives such as community pharmacies, opticians and so on? First Minister. We want people to get care when they need it from the NHS from the most appropriate part of the NHS. And that was true before COVID. It will be true after COVID. Obviously, there are particular reasons why we want that to be the case during COVID. a &E is there for people who, who need a and &E, uh, treatment, but there are many other parts of the NHS, NHS 24, primary care, uh, community pharmacies, uh, that are better placed to give people treatment. So I would encourage people to 
uh, access the, the part of the NHS that is most appropriate for their needs. Uh, staffing pressures are acute on the NHS just now, uh, partly because of COVID. Uh, we are starting to see COVID-related absences stabilise and hopefully uh, reduce uh, now, and, and hopefully that will continue, which will ease a lot of the pressure. Uh, but as we come out of COVID, part of the recovery focus will be on ensuring uh, that we encourage people and give people the support and the information uh, that allows them to know which part of the NHS is most appropriate for their particular needs, because it's not in the interest of any patients to end up being treated in a part of the NHS when actually they would get better and more responsive care somewhere else. Jackson Carlow to be followed by Paul McLean. I listened with care to the First Minister's uh, announcement of a return to hybrid working from the 31st of January. I wonder if she could advise those who assist the corporate body who have to consider these decisions whether the regulations underpinning that will permit a return to one metre social distancing here in the Chamber, in our parliamentary and constituency offices and more widely across the parliamentary campus in order to facilitate that. First Minister. Uh, we'll provide, uh advice and, and, and guidance to the corporate body as we will do to uh, businesses more generally. Um, Cabinet uh, of course discussed this morning the, the wider uh, position but also what that means for the civil service and there will be a return to hybrid working uh, within the civil service uh, from uh, next week as well. So yes I do hope uh, that the underpinning uh, legislative uh, arrangements and the changes that we are making, although it is not for me to decide, will allow the Parliament if not to get back to complete normality but get back to a greater degree of normality in its operations uh, from the start of next week or whenever the corporate body deems that is appropriate. Paul McLennan to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask First Minister, what are the medium and long term strategic aims and objectives for the take of vaccines for those still to have their first, second or booster jags? First Minister. The, the key message is it is never too late to get this vaccination. Uh, you will be able to access uh, vaccines uh, if you haven't had your first, second, third or, or booster dose uh, well into the future. We are the most vaccinated part of the UK in all of these doses, but there are still too many people in Scotland uh, who are eligible who haven't had vaccination. So the message is please come forward for vaccination. Uh, the facilities are there. The uh, capacity is there. The vaccinators are there. Uh, I set out in my statement some of the steps we are taking, uh, for example, to send scheduled appointments to those in uh, the 18 to 59 year old age group who haven't had boosters yet. So we will not give up on trying to get vaccination uh, to every last person in Scotland if it is at all possible. Brian Whittle to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I listened with care, uh, First Minister, to your answer to Paula Kane's question. Uh, but but on, on top of the uh, cancer uh, operations being cancelled, tragically, diagnosis of early stage cancer in Scotland have fallen to the lowest levels in a decade. So can, can I ask the First Minister when and how the Scottish Government will increase the number of diagnoses of breast, colorectal and lung cancer in the first stages of the illness, especially uh, given the fact that they were uh, failing to meet these targets before the pandemic? First Minister. I think um, I've been asked this question rightly so because it is important. Uh, the last two weeks at First Minister's questions, perhaps uh, at least on one of these occasions, I think by uh, Brian Whittle, and I've set out uh, the, the different steps we are taking to ensure the earliest possible diagnosis uh, of the most common cancers, but also extending that to uh, symptoms of cancer that are perhaps not as common um, as uh, the ones that we often think of. So, in summary, uh, continued investment in the Detect Cancer Early Programme, uh, continued uh, work to ensure that those referred on the urgent suspicion of cancer referral pathway are seen uh, as quickly as possible within the 31 and, and 62 day targets and also the uh, new early diagnostic uh, centres uh, that we are establishing which is uh, about making sure there is a rapid uh, route to diagnosis for those uh, with less common symptoms of cancer that wouldn't normally be picked up on that urgent suspicion uh, referral pathway. So there's a range of things that we are doing to make sure that uh, as many people as possible are diagnosed as early as possible. That is critical in terms of the outcomes uh, with cancer patients. Of course, it's not the only factor, making sure that there is then rapid uh, access to the best quality treatment and most appropriate treatment is important too. So all aspects of the cancer journey uh, are under focus in terms of making sure that we make the progress uh, that Brian White Whittle uh, rightly says is vital. And Stephen Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, Margaret Wilson, the Chairwoman of the National Parent Forum of Scotland, told the Education, Children and Young People Committee 
that children are under stricter mitigations than any other member of society. And on face coverings in classrooms, she said, we don't support the continued use of face masks. We have asked for evidence on why they need to be used. So will the First Minister give a straight answer to Scotland's parents? What is the evidence for delaying the end of the requirement for children to wear face masks in classrooms? First Minister. Firstly, there is very strong evidence, very strong published international evidence that one of the most effective non-pharmaceutical interventions that has been used uh, throughout COVID has been face coverings in helping to reduce transmission. That is the first point. The second point about uh, children and, and young people being under uh, more restrictive measures in terms of face coverings. Let's not forget that because, and this is not a criticism of the JCVI, but because of the phased nature of JCVI uh, advice, children uh, are not as vaccinated as adults either. So there is a need to ensure that we are seeking to protect them in other ways. And, you know, I respect uh, the individual cited and quoted in the chamber today. I understand that people have strong views about face coverings, but I also think many young people I speak to, if, even if I was to say uh, today that they no longer need to wear face coverings, I know many young people who would continue to do it because it makes them feel uh, safer. So this is about trying uh, as hard as we can while we're still in a situation. I, I point the member back to uh, one of the uh, statistics I cited in my statement today. In the past week, while cases in every other age group in our country have declined, cases in the under 15 age group have increased by 41 per cent. So we need to continue to take sensible measures to help protect children and young people. Uh, hopefully, while we get vaccination rates uh, higher there and able to vaccinate some younger children. Um, the Tories have never uh, supported, uh, as far as I can recall, uh, face coverings in schools. But I think on that, as on so many other things, they are way out of touch with the majority opinion in Scotland. Yes.